Counterman's Behind the Counter podcast goes behind the scenes of America's parts stores, warehouse distributors, and parts manufacturers with in-depth conversations with the men and women of the automotive aftermarket. Counterman editor Josh Cable takes you beyond the headlines so you can get to know the sales pros who are doing their part to make the aftermarket a great place to do business. Warranty returns are the bane of every parts retailer's existence. But the headache of processing a warranty return is just the tip of the iceberg when you look at the scope of the problem for the automotive aftermarket. The Automotive Sales Council estimates that warranty abuse costs auto parts manufacturers and distributors more than $600 million each year, although members are confident that the actual number is probably much higher. Our guests on this episode are doing their part to educate counterpros on the importance of checking the part before accepting a warranty return at the parts counter. The Automotive Sales Council's Check the Part campaign is an initiative that aims to reduce the sky-high return rate in the automotive aftermarket. Endorsed by the AASA and the Auto Care Association, the campaign's messaging is simple. Open the box, inspect the part, and verify the return. On this episode of the Behind the Counter podcast, we're happy to have Ben Brucato, Vice President of Engagement for the Automotive Aftermarket Suppliers Association, Michael Campana, Senior Manager of Quality Engineering for Dormant Products, and Ryan Coyman, Director of Training for Standard Motor Products. Gentlemen, when we're talking about fraudulent warranty returns in the automotive aftermarket, how big of a problem is this? Non-valid warranty returns are a known problem within the aftermarket industry. It's generally understood as the cost of doing business, but the magnitude is what's really shocking. $600 million in annual avoidable returns is a huge opportunity for waste reduction. This burden is shared 50-50 between the retailers and the manufacturers, even after all the credits have been issued. Hmm. We all benefit by reducing these occurrences. When we look at warranty returns, how does the auto parts sector compare to other retail categories? Good question, Josh. Much higher, in fact. As a percentage of sales, the return rate in auto parts is 22% and the highest across all industries. Clothing apparel is the second highest at 11%, essentially half. Mm -hmm. uh, clothing can be explained by customers buying uh, multiple sizes to get the right fit or just making the wrong gift choices. Mm -hmm. But these are not reasons that translate well into the automotive part sector. We need to start with the basic foundation root causes, including compliance to existing warranty return policies. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. What are some of the most common types of warranty abuse in the aftermarket? And could you share, share a couple of examples that you've come across? Are you sure you really answer that, Josh? <laughs> we, we've seen them all here. You know, it's been uh, pretty interesting. Uh, you know, Michael can share some of his examples here, but uh, I've had our sales team do audits at various customers and in one part category, literally two thirds of the parts that we received were not even standard motor products manufactured product. It was somebody else's product in our box. And you know, in my background as a technician, I understand a little bit about how that happens. Like you might try one part, it doesn't work. So you order another type of part from a different vendor. And then you put, you no longer have the first box. So now you put your defective part in this second box, go back to the shelf. And if that, if that store personnel or delivery driver doesn't actually open it up, now that part goes back to the manufacturer of the package rather than the manufacturer of the part. So that's, that's one of our things here. But we've also seen just blatant out, <laughs> outright fraudulent claims here of, um, you know, a tennis shoe in a box, mm. a water bottle in a box. And, uh, you know, tells us nobody's actually opened the box. They just simply took it back in the name of customer satisfaction and immediately processed it. Some of these are hundred plus dollar parts here. You know, I'm being in one category in which we've got diesel injection pumps or turbos. You know, we're talking well over a thousand dollars. And, uh, you know, it, it'd be nice to verify that this is truly what the customer is saying it is. But mm -hmm. Michael, I know you've got some great examples too. Yeah, we've seen examples of a, a quart of transmission fluid inside the box for a climate control module. We've wow. definitely seen non-automotive parts in our manufacturer boxes. 
and we've all heard stories of the box of rocks, whatever it is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's the old adage that the, uh, the customer is always right, but uh, I think that you can take that a little too far. And, uh, you know, uh, at the very least, the, uh, the, the guys, the gals at the counter can uh, just open the box and make sure that what they say they're returning is actually in the box. And I know that's the, uh, that's, that's the core message of the uh, Check the Park campaign. Yeah, that's really our goal or our whole message here, Josh, is it's literally that simple. Mm -hmm. Open the box and verify that it is what it says it is. And the closer it happens to the transaction point at the counter or at the shop, you know, the easier that conversation is before it goes further down the supply chain, gets to a distribution center or ends up on one of our loading docks. You know, it's uh, very far from the point of accountability at that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, let's talk about the Check the Park campaign. Um, how did this thing get started? Well, it's kicked off a couple of years ago. So there's uh, a group of uh, executives that have formed the Automotive Sales Council. They meet several times a year and, you know, they talk about a variety of issues uh, within the aftermarket. And warranty is certainly one that is near and dear to all of our hearts here. And uh, as we, we face similar concerns, so uh, they tapped us on the shoulder and, uh, you know, a couple of his companies said, you know, hey, we're poised to uh, tackle this. And so our group was formed. We meet every other Friday for the first couple of months or almost the first year. It was every Friday, uh, 10 o'clock Eastern. And we have anywhere from five to 30 different manufacturers represented within that group and mm -hmm. start talking about how we can uh, share best practices here and uh, make kind of a common procedure. You know, we don't want standard to have one set of rules and Dorman to have another set of rules and uh, MPA or Mevotech or Gates or KYV or you know, other participants to have different sets of rules. It becomes very confusing for the counter person trying to follow all these rules. And so we kind of all work together, start with this campaign. And, you know, this is really one of the first initiatives for us is just to get that message out there, keep it concise in simple and clear. You know, from my perspective, it's 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 pretty neat to see, you know, competitors uh, who are kind of working together uh, for a common cause. I think that's uh, you know that's something that's for the good of the industry in the aftermarket, and I think that's what we're seeing here with the Check the Park campaign. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to, uh, you know, talk, ask each of you how you got involved because we've. You know, Ryan, you're director of training uh, for SMP. Uh, you know, Michael's in, in quality engineering. And uh, Ryan, let's start with you. How did how did you get uh, you know get on board with the uh, Check the Park campaign? Well, as with many things, I didn't duck quick enough. You know, so somehow I get voluntold for different jobs. But no, Standard Motor Products has always been very committed to training. We've been doing it since the '60s. And that's really one aspect of this. You know, when you look at warranty concerns, you look at, is it a manufacturing problem? Is it an installation problem? Is it a application problem? Or is it a, a, a fraudulent type return here? And so that's where training really comes in. You know, we do a lot of sales and counter person training uh, for our own staff, as well as, you know, all of our customers. And so helping educate them on messages like this is important, but as we reach out to automotive technicians too, we want to make sure that they are diagnosing vehicles properly and installing the components properly, which are going to help mitigate uh, warranty concerns. And then this really seemed to be a natural fit. So you know, when we think of warranty, it's kind of like a three-legged stool. Is it the right part? Was it installed properly? And you know, did did they uh, return it properly here? Mm -hmm. uh, is it is it a core or is it a um, a, a new return or is it a defective part? And so we have to look at that. And so my team of trainers has helped with new instruction guidelines for our products. We've uh, built installation uh, videos. We've put together uh, identifiers on a lot of our parts. We've put together guides for counter people to help understand, it, you know, is this truly a SMP produced product here or is it a uh, OE or, you know, did it come from Wing Wong Wang overseas or something like that? Mm -hmm. So that, that's how I ended up with this from the educational standpoint. Makes sense. 
Um, Michael, what about you? How did you uh, get involved in Check the Part? Yeah, our team of quality engineers are always seeking to understand how customers are dissatisfied. And they we definitely was a pattern across all the different product lines that we sell that there was this portion of non-valid returns. And we had the opportunity to work with one of our retail partners in crafting messaging, enforcing their warranty policy on some mouse pads. And we ran, we worked together, we created a, uh, a mouse pad that included the detailed steps for the return process, which included open the box, check the part. And within this trial of 300 stores over the course of nine months, there was a reduction in warranty returns in that store versus the control of balance of stores. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just with us because the messaging was agnostic to the manufacturer. Um, when I brought this information to the Automotive Sales Council, uh, our peers basically saw the same positive impact. And that's what really um, changed our thinking to say, let's come up with a consistent messaging that we can all utilize um, to really um, focus the industry on this opportunity. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, we, Ben, we really appreciate you being here representing AASA. Um, how did you get involved in the campaign? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Um, it's it's great being here as well, and uh, it's pretty simple. You know, ASA is a member-driven association. We represent exclusively the suppliers, so just like on this call, Dorman, S and P, and many more. And so, anytime our members uh, identify uh, a challenge or an opportunity in the market, or collectively working on something, we fully support them and and uh, and really help. Um, be a united voice for mm -hmm. suppliers. Uh, warranty returns is not a new one. Um, I, uh, I used to work on the supplier side with Airtex and, uh, and UCI Fram Group when it was that conglomerate. Um, and so I worked on, um, on the warranty returns specifically for, that, uh, for those business units. So it's not a new, new area for me. And, uh, and within the trade association, uh, I specifically that warranty returns really end up falling on the shoulders of the suppliers. Mm. Uh, so it's incredibly important for, for ASA and myself uh, to help uh, educate, you know, whether it's end consumers, uh, parts pros uh, on the warranty, um, you know, the warranty return issue. And one thing I'll say is that the great thing about Check the Part is that it, it really it, it takes the warranty return discussion a little bit to, as Ryan said, at a more simple base, right? We've always talked about warranty returns as a miss, an issue of misdiagnosis, which is absolutely the fact in a lot of areas, you know, especially in the DIFM part. People are misdiagnosing uh, vehicles. They use parts to diagnose what the problem is. Well, that didn't fix it. Let me return. And we're saying, you know what? Yes, absolutely. Companies like Standard Motor Products uh, specifically had a great training to, for diagnostics and technical training. We're just saying, hey, let's get the basic level. Just open the box and make sure the right part is in there. And, and so we're very uh, uh, supportive of the supplier community in this area. And, and that's why ASA is, is involved in these calls and this initiative and, and helping move this along for the industry as a whole. Makes sense. Uh, let's delve into the uh, Check the Part campaign a little bit more. Uh, what are the main components of uh, Check the Part? I think one of the first things is identifying, is it what they say it is? You know, I, you don't have to be a rocket scientist or have any uh, longevity of experience behind the counter to understand, you know, if you open up a box, it's supposed to be a fuel injector and there's a rock in there. You know, and uh, some of these are just blatant, outright, you know, significant differences like that. Next is, you know, identify the, the manufacturer. Is it made by the person whose name is on the box? If not, that product should probably go back to the identifier of that. And within that is some different levels of components. I mean, um, I walk through our return centers and, 
you, know, you see something that looks like it came off the uh, the floor of the ocean, you know, a product from the, the Titanic, yet the invoice shows that it was in service for one day. Mm. It was billed out and returned on the same day. Mm. And it's just, um, it's, it's very blatant with that stuff. Now, again, I spent 16 years as a, as a technician myself and running different shops and understand that mistakes get made. You know, I, I can tell you, and I apologize to my friends in the rubber category where, you know, a car comes in with a broken belt. You feel all the components and it seems okay, but you put that new belt on and then you realize, oh, oops, the water pump is seized up. Mm. And so you just smoke that new belt. That ends up back in the return bin, you know, and it's uh, it's just by looking at stuff like that, again, it, it's seriously as simple as opening the box with this stuff, but. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Michael elaborate a little bit on his thoughts here, too. It's not so much about just opening the box. It's changing the expectation of the customer that's returning the part that the box will be opened. And we know that that alone will create a huge positive impact in reducing these type of returns. So that's so currently that's uh, which I find hard to believe, but it, it sounds like currently that's not the norm. Um, necessarily at, at, at part stores that, you know, they're just accepting these returns. And I'm sure, you know, there are stores that actually do look at, at, at the open the box, but it sounds like industry-wide, it, it must not be the norm to, uh, to be opening the box. Yeah, I would say it's definitely not the norm. And I think, as you mentioned earlier, Josh, is you know, customer service is obviously at the forefront of, uh, of a lot of the distributors, and rightly so, and that should be that way. And as the industry is evolving, Ryan alluded to, uh, I think, turbos, but, you know, it's it's one thing to return an item that's, uh, you know, maybe 10 bucks or something like that and, and, and focusing on customer service, but uh, it's really not at, at, the, at the heart of it. A, products are getting more expensive. So that, you know, you can't return... Uh, just parts um, like that, you know, like you did at one point you did on a more, at least less expensive product. However, um, it's really not customer service by allowing customers to just get by, especially on the DIFM side. I think uh, having the integrity and honesty and, and just best practice of checking the part, making sure and saying, hey, I'm sorry, you know, we're, we're happy to return the part. We're not saying you can't return parts, just return the right part. And that's, and that's the of this. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Well, I think it, another aspect to that and one that Michael touched on also, it turns into a missed opportunity for the store. You know, before we sound like a bunch of whiny manufacturers here saying this comes back to us, it's a missed sales opportunity for the store. Mm -hmm. So every time they have to reach in the register and hand that hundred bucks back or a thousand dollars back, that's something that should have been sold to that person mm -hmm. and now that affects the the bottom line of that store or even you know as a store manager and they're compensated on the the sales of that store for that week you know that's that could have a significant impact here and so um it's not just the part coming back but it's that missed sales opportunity mm -hmm. there so this you know this is really is a twofold issue it's a great point and uh as far as the, uh, the the campaign, the check the park campaign, what's what are the goals? What are you trying to uh, accomplish with uh, with this campaign? Well, ultimately, warranty mitigation. You know, reduce a lot of these fraudulent comebacks. Um, and again, as Michael said, just sometimes by changing the mentality and saying, you know, what, somebody is actually looking at this. Somebody is checking this stuff. It's it's a behavioral change for everybody, mm -hmm. knowing that they're being policed here is going to uh, have a significant effect on this. You know, my own sales team has been going through different bins and seeing that already. And so our goal certainly is not to become sales prevention. We're always, you know, customer centric and customer friendly organizations, but we just want to keep everybody uh, straight and honest and, and send the right part back to the right manufacturer of it or deny that warranty, uh, keep the accountability at the front level there and you know really it's going to help control costs all throughout the industry do you get a sense this is more of a diy problem or more of a difm problem or maybe a mix of both 
I definitely think that uh, it, it's a problem for both, uh, you know, DIFM and DIY, but probably more prevalently on the DIY side. And the reason for that, I think, on the DIFM, if you start, you know, potentially scamming or you're sending a lot of product back to the store and they finally check, you can the the parts store can always call back that shop and say, "Hey, mm -hmm. by the way, last week you returned a brick." You know, yeah. there's, so there's a relationship there. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, uh, I think shops are a little bit, you know, probably smart enough to not do that kind of stuff. Not in all cases. But uh, so I think it's primarily DIY. But we've, when I was at AirTex, we, we saw things coming back from the DIFM place as well, especially like Ryan was saying, uh, a product of a, of a different manufacturer sent over. But, uh, but primarily DIY. I don't know if Michael or Ryan, you agree with me there. No, I, I agree 100% here. It is a strong mix of this. Um, it's a different mix, you know, and that's where I think we're seeing more of the um, errant, you know, not intentional uh, changes here. It's just one manufacturer's box is in, or one manufacturer's product is in another manufacturer's box, or sometimes a core gets mislabeled as a, as a warranty issue. I think you see more of that from the uh, DIFM segment, whereas the DIY, um, <laughs> you, you see all sorts of different stuff here. And, you know, I, I've talked to different store managers and counter people in my town, and, you know, they said that's that's our company policy is to take care of that customer. And back to Ben's earlier point, are you really taking care of them by just blatantly giving their money back? And at some point, uh, the pain gets shared across the industry as a result it's higher prices. Mm -hmm. It's often difficult for us to understand whether it's a DIY or DIFM, but we know we've had some recent cases. Um, one example last week was a pair of exhaust manifolds that came back from the same retailer, the same RGA, the same store with the same return date, and both the left and the right hand side were for the same application, mm. and both sides were cracked. Mm -hmm. We don't know where that originated from, but we do think that there's some other underlying cause that would not cause both parts to fail that way at the same mm -hmm. time. Absolutely. Uh, where can people go to learn more about the Check the Part initiative? Uh, that's a great question and pretty easy. So it's checkthepart.com. We try to make it easy for the, uh, the industry. Again, it's a, it's a great website because it's uh, mobile friendly as well, and it's brand agnostic. So it's not mm -hmm. you know one supplier saying this, this is the industry trying to help the industry at large. Uh, this helps both shops, parts stores, uh, and suppliers. So all the information can be found on checkthepart.com. Okay. And as I mentioned in the intro, um, Auto Care Association and AASA have endorsed the uh, Check the Park campaign. How did the associations get involved? Yeah, so again, as I had mentioned earlier, um, the association, especially AASA, represents exclusively the suppliers. You know, the suppliers definitely, uh, the warranty returns is typically a trickle down effect to the supplier. So, you know, the part. Uh, is uh, you know installed at, at the shop. The shop is returning the part at the distributor. Distributor then sends it back to the supplier for credit, and the supplier kind of holding the bag and saying, "Well, this wasn't my part, or this isn't a part at all." And so, uh, as a, as a voice of the supplier community, that's why ASA is involved. And and something really important and to keep in mind, ASA's members are all based and have operations in North America. Mm -hmm. um, so our ASA members represent a very large portion of labor. In fact, that's the largest manufacturing um, segment and sector in North America is auto parts manufacturing. Two, over 2% 2 of GDP uh, made up of, uh, of these companies. So when you're looking at a huge dollar cost for the industry, specifically for supply. We're talking about North American and USA jobs, you know? Mm -hmm. So just because of an oversight or a scam or a mistake um, of, of returning a fraudulent part or not the part that's supposed to be returned, 
you know, that trickle down effect, we don't think about it. But if we stop and say, wow, this is costing people's jobs. I mean, I remember being at a supplier company and, and looking at that return number and saying, whoa, this is millions of dollars. That's, mm. that's you know, headcount. Uh, and so I think Check the Part is such a great initiative because it's simple. It's telling parts pros, just open the box, validate that the part being returned is that part, and then move on. And if the industry can learn how to just do that, let's look at that as how many people's jobs are we saving in our industry and in this economy. We know labor shortage is a big issue. You know, why not do the easy, I hate the term, you know, the low hanging fruit, but this is one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why ASA feels it is very important. And, and we are fully supporting the supplier community on that. And that's why we're part of that. So for our viewers today, whether they're a parts specialist or a store manager, store owner, why should a parts store care about fraudulent warranty returns? Missed sales opportunities is what I would say first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, because if they're if they're taking a part back and warranting it when it shouldn't have been warrantied, they should have been making the sale there at that point. Or they're taking cash out of the register to uh, to make that return there when a sale again should be made. Second would be uh, cost reduction. You know, as manufacturers, we can only eat so much of this, and typically we're doing uh, doing the right thing and we're passing those costs back onto the consumer here. And so, uh, you know, like we say, training doesn't cost; it pays. Same thing could really be said here about uh, checking the part or reducing warranty. This is an opportunity for the store to increase their profits, either through the additional sales or just the the, the reduction in the loss by honoring the, those invalid warranty returns. And by putting that saved money back into the industry, we can further grow as an industry. And with the inflation we're seeing right now, I mean, anything that's driving up costs unnecessarily is something, uh, you know, I think Ben mentioned, you know, the, the, the term low hanging fruit. I mean, if there's something simple you can do to, to, uh, to keep, keep costs in check, I mean, it uh, just seems like a no brainer to me. And that's what we thought. This is uh, really very simple and very rudimentary, even for that, that counter person on their first day in the job, right? They can, uh, any part that's coming back across the counter, we even encourage before making the sale, open the box up, show the, show the customer the part that you're selling them. Mm -hmm. And that transitions into that habit of when the part comes back, you open that box and you review the part with them, identify the marks on it, make sure it is what it says it's supposed to be. And, you know, in today's cataloging world with 3D and 360 imaging, look at, look at your catalog. And many times you're going to be able to quickly identify, is this the part that they're saying it is? Well, before we sign off, uh, I want to give our viewers one last takeaway from this discussion. You know, what's something that parts stores and counter pros can do today uh, to address the, the problem of fraudulent warranty returns in the automotive aftermarket? I would say to start, um, as Brian mentioned, open the box, present it to the customer, and have a conversation with them to really be confident that they are getting the right part for their application, that they have the right tools to do the job right, um, and all the parts they need to get the job complete. Hmm. On the return side, if a customer does make the return, open the box to make sure it's what you expect and it falls within yeah. uh, the warranty policy. I would also like to mention that reducing the noise of invalid warranty returns permits us as problem solvers to focus our energies more efficiently. We all want customers to be satisfied. And as manufacturers, we're looking for feedback on how to improve our products. So if the return is legitimate, I would even ask that you fill in the detailed explanation right on the side of the box. Mm -hmm. Give us a little reason for why it truly is a valid warranty return. Mm -hmm. This is how we can improve. Great point. Yeah, absolutely. That's always important to every, every one of us here is understanding how to better improve our products and and serve our customers better. Those times when the counter people open up the box and they find that bottle of transmission fluid instead of uh, an HVAC controller or a tennis shoe, uh, we also have a spot on our website there. We actually host a contest to see 
uh, what type of stuff people have run across. So go to checkthepart.com and you can submit your entry there um, and, and share some of the stuff with us. You know, it's unbelievable what we've seen so far and we're sure that we haven't seen it all at this point yet. So <laughs> we're, we're asking industry to, uh, you know, simply open the box, check the part, and it, it's really that simple. I want to thank our guests, Ben Brucato, Michael Campana, and Ryan Coyman for joining us on this episode of the Behind the Counter podcast. We'll see you next time, and don't forget to check the part. Thanks, Josh. I appreciate you having us. Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Behind the Counter podcast. To stay up to date on the latest news and trends, as well as the latest podcast episodes, be sure to subscribe to the Counterman newsletter at counterman.com.